Afternoon, doctor. How are you doing? Good afternoon. It's great to be with you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, to start off with, why don't we let our listeners know a little bit about your uh, background, just as far as your full name, your title, and uh, w- where are you from? Yeah, so uh, my name is Francisco Sigueroa, and I was born and raised in Laredo, Texas. And I am the director of University Transplant Center at the University of Texas Health Science Center and at University Hospital. And I have one of the greatest jobs in the world, and that is to take care of patients, both children and adults, with end-stage kidney disease and, you know, be able to make them better through the world of transplantation. So how old were you when you decided that that's what you wanted to do? When I was born. Actually, uh, I mean, there's a lot of truth to that because I'm a third generation physician. And so, um, you know, we were surrounded by the love of medicine through my father and through my grandfather. And dad would come home every day with a smile. And he was smiling every day because of the wonderful joys he had taking care of patients and making them better. And it was contagious. And many of us in my family ended up pursuing medicine. And so really, my earliest memories are I wanted to be like dad, which, you know, he had the privilege of being a wonderful physician. And he practiced until nearly the age of 95. He was practicing medicine until a week before he passed away. And so his passion and his love of medicine, fortunately, has been handed down to the next generation. I'll ask you a couple more questions just kind of about your uh, your long list of accomplishments in a little while. But moving forward, what is the Center for Life and what inspired it? Well, the, I mean, the inspiration for the Center of Life uh, really came about through conversations that Dr. Glenn Half, who was my uh, predecessor is director of the Transplant Center, uh, Joe Nesprall, who is uh, the director of the Texas Organ Sharing Alliance, otherwise known as TOSA, which is our you know, organ procurement organization. And Jennifer Melton, who is the executive director, actually the, the chief administrative um, officer for our Transplant Center. And Through these conversations, it became apparent that having the opportunity to take care of those deceased donors who are, you know, brain dead and want to actually give the gift of life, you know, that we felt that we should really honor that desire to provide the gift of life when you pass away. And and we felt that a center for life could be a very, very special place to be able to take care of donors and honor their wishes. And at the same time, be a special place, you know, where the, the donors, loved ones, family members, you know, could be in a environment that truly honors and admires and loves the donors. And so, you know, we also realized that, you know, many donors could not fulfill their wish of donating their organs when they passed away, either because they were in small health centers that did not have the capacity to be able to stabilize patients. Or, or deceased donors, uh, that, that is from their physiology. You know, they're, they're brain dead, but physiologically, their organs are still alive because the heart is still beating. That, you know, many donors were too unstable, 
you know, where a small house center can really stabilize those donors such that you can actually get to the point where surgeons come down and are able to, you know, compassionately procure, you know, the donor's organs. And so we realized that if those health centers had a center where these deceased donors could be transported to, if we have an entire team working and stabilizing the donor, optimizing the management and the physiology of the donor, that we were able to actually procure more organs and successfully transplant those organs into patients. And so the Center for Life actually opened its doors in February. And it has been a tremendous success. Um, it's exceeded our expectations. It could not have opened at a more important time in our history because you know, COVID-19 actually made it very difficult for smaller hospitals to be able to actually manage a, a brain dead deceased donor. And because of the Center for Life, we were able to maintain you know, the volume of transplants and to be able to actually procure organs and send them to other centers you know, where patients were in greater need. And so the Center of Life is now you know, really one of the very first of its kind, you know, being in a comprehensive teaching hospital associated with a comprehensive academic health center and also having a research arm such that we can actually, you know, learn how to better stabilize these patients. And then also, you know, developing a biorepository where later on, you know, we can determine you know, the, the success of the transplants over years to our patients, and then also having tissue and serum to be able to kind of compare, you know, are there certain genetics or certain genotypes or certain aspects of the donor that actually, um, you know, are able to make transplant even more successful. And so um, it's really a very, very wonderful center that honors the wishes of someone who wants to donate their organs upon you know, passing away, and at the same time, manages their loved ones in a very compassionate and empathetic way in a far more private area than you would be in a very busy hospital surrounded by so many other you know, aspects that make it even more stressful for a loved one. I, I was speaking with Tiffany earlier, and she let me know that you have a, a large repository of kidney biopsies. So before I ask this next question, just so we make sure that everybody understands what that is, can you explain briefly what a... Uh... So, so a biorepository, just in general, is um, a biobank, in a sense, where we are able to store indefinitely frozen tissue and frozen serum. And, and the purpose of that is to be able to study um, important molecular signatures that could potentially better improve outcomes. And let me give you a simple example, not related to transplantation, but 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 I think it brings it, it brings the message home. So all of us know individuals who have had cancer. And we know that many cancers still don't have good treatments. For example, liver cancer. And even certain types of kidney cancers. And so whenever a surgeon removes that cancer, we sample the cancer as well as we sample a normal piece of tissue that doesn't incorporate the cancer, that is adjacent to the cancer, because you need to get a margin for a cure. So we have both normal tissue and cancerous tissue. And then we're able to actually freeze that tissue 
and be able to study it indefinitely. Now that tissue has many, many clues as to why cancers develop. And some of those clues are mutations, you know, where a gene is overexpressed or underexpressed. Some of those clues are that, you know, a protein may be in, in not the appropriate balance. And, and so there's many clues that we can actually derive as to what resulted, you know, why was this patient more predisposed to this cancer? Now, you also need to understand that medicine advances every year. And so 10 years from now, we're going to have even more powerful tools to study why that cancer developed. So 10 years from now, we can actually go back, get that tissue because it's frozen and study it with more powerful tools. And out of that will be an understanding of the molecular signatures. And if you understand that, then you can develop new therapeutics or new drugs that are highly targeted for that cancer, right? So, so now you're beginning to understand targeted therapies because targeted personalized therapies are based on molecular signatures. All right, so now we expand that for the very first time, because the center of life is the first to do this, is to actually be able to, and this is again, it's part of the informed consent you know, of donation, is that we're able to actually sample a piece of tissue of the kidney or, or liver, um, you know, of the donor and then be able to determine how that, how that molecular signature either doesn't change or changes once that organ is implanted or transplanted into a patient. So, um, I mean, you don't really have to utilize too much imagination to understand that there could be some very powerful clues to determine how a transplant organ changes, you know, after transplantation, after immune suppression. Um, are there factors that actually protect that kidney from developing changes from diabetes later on or not, uh, hypertension or not. And, and so this is really a whole new world of, of you know, research you know, focused on organs that become transplanted, you know, and so this, this is going to open up a whole new chapter in transplant science and the understanding of transplantation. You know, and, and also not everybody needs as much immune suppression, right? I mean, some patients need higher immune suppression than others. And are there clues that we can glean from by studying the genetics or the molecular signatures of the tissue that we transplanted into a patient, right? So it may be that some organs don't require that much immune suppression because they have a different molecular signature. And if you understand that, then you can titrate immune suppression and therefore the patient who gets transplanted has less side effects from immune suppression. You know, at the end of the day, we wanna tailor medications to the biology and the physiology of a patient. But now a patient who's undergone a transplant has a little bit of a hybrid biology because you, you know, are caring, you know, and, and nurturing the organ of someone who passed away, of, of not, not your molecular signature. So a lot to be learned from here. And, and we're only at the very tip of the iceberg. So you might have answered part of this next question. How are you working with your research teams to expedite impactful use of the repository? Well, um, actually, once the research teams understand that we have such a biorepository, you know, they're knocking on our doors, right? Because there are a lot of physician scientists who are wanting to improve the quality of life of those who are transplanted. And part of improving that quality of life is understanding the biology 
you know, of the transplanted organ. And so, um, you know, the scientists are very enthusiastic in helping them solve, you know, these pieces of the puzzle, you know, that, that will make us better physicians and, and develop better medicines to treat patients. So we're very, we're very excited about it. So, so it's, it's, it's almost like it's, it's also offering just uh, the opportunity for, for a wealth of knowledge or, or, or learning. It, it, it will provide an opportunity. Let, let's put it this way. It opens up the doors to learn a whole new wealth of knowledge because it's not an opportunity. It's actually a door opening. It's a fact. So the UTC is a university transplant center. What is a typical patient at UTC? What do they look like? Or, or who is a typical patient at UTC? Well, UTC, you know, standing for University Transplant Center, well, we take care of many patients with, you know, different diseases. We care for patients in need of lung transplantation. We care for patients in need of kidney transplantation. We care for patients in need of liver transplantation. We educate and take care of patients who want to be living donors. That is, you or I want to donate a kidney or a segment of our liver to save somebody else's life. That's called living donation. So we, we educate donors and then we, we expertly care for them during the whole donation process and thereafter. And then we have a very, very busy clinic, you know, providing, you know, incredible care to these patients and their loved ones throughout their life. Once you become a transplant patient, you're part of family of, of our family for the rest of our collective lives. And once you are a living donor, you are part of our family for life because you're a champion. And you know, we also expertly care for patients who have, who have passed away and want to be donors. And we forever respect them. And we forever, you know, treasure, you know, their, their, their family members. Uh, because we are a part of their grieving process, but we're also a part of the celebration that their loved one save many other people's lives. It's, it's a very, very, very special profession, you know, with, you know, both heartache because somebody has passed away, but then also with the joys of knowing that that donor's wish saved not one person's life, but many people's lives. It's, it's, I just can't imagine another profession quite like this. This has been a big year for you. In light of the new artificial kidney devices, therapeutics, and techniques that are being developed, where do you see transplantation headed? I, I think the major challenge that exists in transplantation is that those in need of transplantation are far greater in number than, you know, donors that provide the gift of life. And so even to this day, about 15% of patients on the waiting list pass away because they were unable to get transplanted. Specifically, for our conversation in regards to kidney transplant, some patients have to wait eight or 10 years to get transplanted when they don't have a living donor available to them. I mean, that's, 10 years is a long time. Eight years is a long time. One year is a long time. And so I really think that, you know, the next great chapter in the field of transplantation will be in the field of 
organ preservation. That is, how can you actually, you know, procure an organ that, you know, was physiologically not great because of instability of the donor or other factors? And how through organ preservation research, you can actually transition that suboptimal organ to become an optimal organ for transplantation. And I believe that, you know, the technology that has, that, that has evolved over the past three years, which is really the ability to actually perfuse those procured organs out of the body in, a, in, in almost an incubator setting where you actually can provide pulsatile blood flow allows us to actually, you know, biomedically adapt the organ to become an optimal organ for transplant. So, you know, for example, we can give um, different medications, you know, to be able to actually improve the blood supply, for example, to the kidney. Or we can utilize different medications to, you know, perhaps reverse some of the effects of, of the instability of a donor, or perhaps even protect the kidney in the future from diabetic nephropathy, or, you know, the impact of diabetes on a transplanted kidney. Um, you know, in, in South Texas, um, really throughout the United States, you know, obesity has become an epidemic. And with obesity, that, you know, in about 20% of people could result in what we call a fatty liver. And fatty livers tend not to be optimal organs for transplantation. Let's say if they're over 30% fatty. Well, imagine if we can actually, you know, put this procured liver from a, from a deceased donor into a pump that we're able to actually provide, you know, blood supply to the liver and then utilize different medications that can actually deplete the liver of this fat, right? And so now you've actually been able to physiologically improve that procured liver and make it an optimal liver to transplant somebody. So imagine if we can expand the donor pool, not only by educating more people to be living donors, but also to expand the deceased donor pool, then we've made a real difference. Uh, really diminishing that imbalance between donors on the waiting list, I mean, I mean patients on the waiting list and available donors. You know, the, the next really, exciting phase in transplantation as we develop, you know, new tools to understand, you know, immune suppression. I mean, imagine if we can actually develop new immune suppressions that really present, prevent not only acute rejection, but chronic rejection, and also to have limited side effects to a patient. You know, and, and, and that's within our realm, that's within our reach in our lifetime. And so um, one thing about medicine, it's, it's continuously improving. And, you know, one thing great about an academic health center and, you know, transplant center is that we are inspiring medical students and health professionals to be thinking about what if we could do this in the future. And so the next generation of healthcare providers and scientists, you know, are, 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 are seeing these things that actually you know, young people have these great ideas that us older people don't, and, and that's how these issues get solved. And so, you know, we're in this wonderful, you know, mix of talent, of both young and more senior healthcare professionals and scientists and ethicists and so forth, that when you put all these individuals together, great things happen. And that's the great thing about University Transplant Center. We've got incredible human talent who are passionate about making lives better. And, um, and because of that, we're seeing these 
innovations like the Center for Life. Um, and, and we encourage people to have ideas like this. And, and I think that's what inspires a team. So you made the statement, you said, it's the young minds that you encourage to think what if. When you first came out of medical school, what were some of your what ifs? You know, I mean, when I was coming out of medical school, really the, the most, I mean, this is kind of my perspective, right? Everybody's got different perspectives, but my personal perspective was, wow, you know, cardiac surgery is absolutely amazing. And, and this is when Dr. DeBecky and Dr. Cooley and Dr. Bernard, you know, were just beginning heart transplantation. And, you know, I remember the first mechanical devices, artificial hearts that were developed. And I remember the what if conversation was, wow, what if, what if, you know, you can actually biomedically engineer a heart and grow a heart, right, from a cell. And, and so, you know, those were some of the, like, what ifs. Well, you know, go 30 years later, and in fact, you know, biomedical engineers, you know, are actually able to, you know, create tracheas and bladders, you know, even, you know, kind of rudimentary kidneys uh, through, you know, various different cell lines. And so, I mean, that's not going to be an impossible dream, you know, 10 or 20 years from now. So, um, you know, these are, you know, the what ifs. And, and I remember being a youngster watching uh, a movie, I think it was called Fantastic Voyage. And it was where uh, a patient had a brain tumor and the only, and, and it was unresectable from a surgical perspective. And the only way, and this is a movie in, in like the 1960s, that, you know, the, the doctors could actually you know, get rid of this tumor was actually an experimental where you actually miniaturize people in a little submarine and they injected <laughs> the little submarine with the people in it and they had a laser and they, you know, they actually navigated themselves to where this tumor is and all these cells were trying to attack the submarine, but they actually were able to kill the tumor through this laser therapy. And it was like, wow, well now, right, we have, you know, nanomedicine, you know, these little nanoparticles, these little nano cameras that, you know, that crazy idea in the 1960s, actually, you know, we're doing some of that. And so, you know, these are the what if conversations that I promise you 10 or 20 years from now, you know, are going to be saying, wow, Sigaroa was a great doctor, but he was sure using these antiquated techniques. You know, why do they have to make incisions to take care of this? All right. I mean, that's the type of good stuff that's happening. I, I highly doubt they'll ever say that any of the techniques you used were antiquated. But no, it'll <laughs> happen. <laughs> so you've been a pioneer for the Mexican-American medical community, and you recently received the Champions of Health Award because of your work to build the next generation of healthcare leaders. So how important is diversity to you during this time in history? Well, diversity is key to, you know, the success of our world. Um, you know, first of all, you know, the world is a very diverse place with individuals of diverse backgrounds and, you know, diverse ancestry. Um, I think that really excellent healthcare requires a sense of cultural competency. Uh, one needs to understand you know, a patient's culture, a patient's language, um, you know, patient's views on different diseases. And, and that diversity is not just diversity of color or ethnicity or socioeconomics or religion. It, it is a understanding of, of of an individual in a holistic manner. And, you know, I truly believe that um, health 
you know, is also linked to understanding one's cultural diversity. Um, I believe that health is also linked, you know, to, to the arts and, you know, humanities. Um, because it's not only physical health, it's spiritual and mental health. And so we as healthcare providers, you know, need to understand, you know, the patient as a whole rather than just as, you know, Mr. Mr. A or Mr. or Miss B, you know, has a problem with his or her kidney. It's, it's much more than that. And then also understanding the role of family, because when somebody's got a chronic disease, it affects the entire family. Um, it, it is, it's a heavy, heavy burden, you know, on a family, on a loved one member's shoulders when they're caring for somebody who's chronically ill. So, you know, we have to be sensitive to that. So you're, you're on the board of the Ford Foundation and uh, you, you were also appointed by two different presidents one of the presidents was a Democrat and one was a Republican. So with that being said, what kind of compliment is that to you that, that not one political party over the other picked you? you? You were appointed by two presidents from two different political parties. That has to have some sort of validation or, or just compliment. Because especially in, in these days, Political parties are so strong. It's almost as if, you know, if a Republican likes you, then the Democratic side's not so much and, and, and vice versa. So to, to be picked by both sides to hold a position or be part of a committee or a board, that, that has to be self-gratifying. You know, I never really thought about it that way, um, you know, in the sense of being selected to to different committees by, you know, presidents um, reflective of two, you know, parties. Um, I gather both of them just saw me as a physician. And, um, you know, rather than being politically inclined one way or the other, and that, you know, they, they probably viewed me as somebody who was an advocate, you know, for a patient, you know, no matter their background. You know, which could also be, you know, their, their, their political affiliations, right? And, and so, you know, I guess it is an honor to be viewed as somebody who, you know, cares for all patients, no matter their backgrounds uh, or their affiliations. And, and that really, what really matters most, you know, is, is the health of our citizens and the health of our nation. Um, because, you know, without health, you know, the outlook's not good. And so um, I was honored by both President Bush and President Obama that, you know, they entrusted me, you know, with the work, you know, related to the committees that they put me on. It was a true honor. Was, was there ever a, a moment where you're being appointed by a president or receiving a phone call and it's, it, you just say to yourself, wow, I'm, you know, I'm talking to the president of the United States or I'm being asked by the president to do this because that's not something that that a lot of people ha have, you know, that's just not a, a daily occurrence for a lot of people. Well, it is an honor to be, you know, asked, you know, by by the president's staff. It's not like I got a phone call, you know, you know, for the president, uh, but but. You know, it is an honor to be recognized, you know, by the president and have, you know, his and hopefully someday her staff um, invite me to participate in an important matter, you know, in, in their administrative agenda. And so um, by serving on those committees, I did have an opportunity to visit both with, you know, President Bush and then President Obama. And, uh, you know, it's amazing when you meet when I met both presidents, they were really incredibly, you know, kind human beings that can have a conversation just the way you and I are having. 
and and they were sincerely grateful for the service rendered by you know the committee so it was a very rewarding experience and you know obviously a very rewarding experience to go to the white house and you know meet with the president in person i know that you have a lot more to do in your career but if if you were to retire tomorrow what would you look back and say that was my greatest accomplishment or that that's what I'm most proud of accomplishing? I think my, my greatest accomplishment, you know, didn't just happen one time. It happens every time when I'm able to save somebody's life, you know, through, you know, the, the gift of transplantation. And, um, you know, I've been privileged to be able to do that for, children and for adults. And um, I never take it for granted. I still pray every time I do a transplant to make sure that I can do the very best job I humanly can. And um, thankfully, there's many more successes than there are uh, poor outcomes in, in our field because we have such a great team. Um, and just like that, I come home with a smile every day. It's kind of hard not to, you know, when you have the opportunity to improve the quality of life of any human being. It's what we're here for. Definitely puts in perspective the difference between a, a, what, a, what a real stressful day is and <laughs> what just occurrences are during, during the day kind of it simplifies things a, a little bit yeah well i mean it's it's a heavy a heavy responsibility taking care of you know of a patient and you know before i operate on any baby i still call my mother to pray for that baby and and to pray for the team um every every little bit helps so there are a lot of people behind the scene including my mom you know, that are, that are, you know, helping get the patient better.